Welcome, everybody. I'm Emmanuel St. Germain. Uh, I'm the CEO of Choice Mortgage Group. You are on Stop Whining About Real Estate. I've got my co-host, Sarah Birnbaum over here. She is the Director of Business Development. We've got an absolute rock star of our first guest, Mr. David Searle. Uh, many of you know him as a broker owner of Remax Services. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, this is pretty much a Huge honor, you know, to be on the first episode. Like, that's so cool. So I appreciate you having us. We love Thank having you. you here. Or having me. Well, and, I'm and, as big as us, but just me. <laughs> yes, well, and of course, we can't wait to get all your feedback. We know that you've got a podcast yourself, Brokers with Breakfast. Tell us a little bit about that and how you got started. Yeah, so we started about uh, almost seven years ago, and uh, it really started with to perpetuate professionalism and uh, collaboration within the industry, which we thought was sorely lacking. And so we brought in different brands, different affiliates and whatnot, and we had a really, really good um, opportunity to speak, and it was all in person, right? Everything was in person, and then COVID happened. Well, even before that, everyone has to have a stick, right? With the podcast, you got to have like a stick. So our stick was like secret handshakes. So we would do Facebook Lives, and we do secret handshakes, and you know, belly bump, and all that kind of stuff, and... Wait, would each guest have their own oh, secret? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. And, and we'd have returning guests, and they would do the same one, right? I like so that. It was Sarah, cool. We're going to so have like, to figure yeah. out what our stick is going to be. <laughs> yes. I don't know that I want to do belly bumps. <laughs> yeah. but. I don't know. I, I, a few people, you know, went out the window, but sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, it was really, uh, it, you know, it was really fun or whatever. And then COVID happened. Well, then you're not even allowed to even talk about handshakes, let alone, you know, shake a hand. Yes. So... We uh, we went to like an intro thing and, and we did a couple other things. But I think every podcast needs, you know, somewhat of a stick. But the Breakfast of the Broker, we've been, uh, you know, been doing this almost seven years. Um, up until recently, we were doing it every Tuesday. Uh, it was crazy. It was a, a lot of guests, a lot of content. I think we're on episode 223. Um, so thank yeah. you. Um, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And you do it live, right? Like you. We used to do it live, okay. um, but then um, we stopped the live, and 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 now uh, I've gone to the podcast stuff. Okay. And, uh, more of subscription stuff. So I won't ask you which guest would you never ask to be back, but I will ask you the <laughs> reverse because I, I don't want you to put you on the spot. Who was the n number one guest that you thought was absolutely amazing that you think we should bring on our show? Ooh. You know that, that's a you know that's an interesting question because I've had a I've had um, one on ones in South Africa, in Dubai, <laughs> in Israel. So wherever I would travel, I would have the one on ones, right? And I would uh, bring people. So and they were really really interesting. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, Janine. Janine was good. Janine was good. Um, I'll tell you about an interesting experience. I Love was um, I was at R4 uh, for the Remax conference, and Adam Contos was the CEO at the time, and I was going to interview him. And he said, you know what? Why don't you interview me in the green room? So I'm interviewing. I'm going to interview him in the green room. He's like, oh, I'll be right back. And and uh, he introduced Damon John. Damon John came over or whatever, and and went up to the the stage. And um, and and then Adam came back and we we interviewed. Um, so that was just a cool experience. Um, you know, CEO of of Remax. Uh, I've also I've done uh, you know quite a few people, top hundred companies and stuff like that. I think leadership is really important. Especially in this day and age, I think people define leadership differently. And too often people think they're a leader, but they're really not. And um, I, I like to be around people that are just better leaders than I am, um, smarter people than I am, you know. And um, so I, I kind of gravitate to that. Speaking of leadership, so what do you think are some of the skill sets and attributes of a great leader? I think you got to be humble. Um, I think you, you got to check your ego at the door. I think where to go, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, because people respect those people who, uh, who show them the way rather than tell them, you know, the way. And, you know, I think people really need, um, caring and empathy and understanding, but they need that humility because, 
without the humility, they have a hard time following you. You know, um, and there's certain people that are just followers, and there's certain people that are that are you know co- leaders. Or when I, I don't think you, I don't believe you're born a leader. I believe that you are learned through your product of your own environment. Um, people bring you along, and whoever you are surrounding yourself with is bringing you along. And if you surround yourself with leaders, you're going to be a leader. Sarah, you've gotten to work with me now for three or four years. <laughs> what would you say my leadership style is like? Uh, You know, yours is actually really interesting because I think people from the outside might think that your leadership style is very kind of controlling and overbearing. The magic, I think, that happens with you is that you are very good at a lot of things. I think the, the gold with you is that you understand that there are other people that are better at certain things than you are. And so you're what you've done is you bring in the people that are really good at the other things that you are not to lead in those spaces. And you kind of let them go. You're not a micromanager. You don't over control things. Um, I think you in your brain think you were born as a leader. Uh, Mm. So I think maybe not everybody, but I think (laughs) you particularly know that you are supposed to lead. Um, But I think your style in person is a lot different than what maybe other people may, may think it is. For me, I didn't I didn't know how you were going to be a leader, but I think in working with you, I've had the most freedom and flexibility to do my job than I've ever had in any other career and every other any other company. And to me, that that makes a great leader because you let us go. You let us fall on our face sometimes when you not to teach us but a you lesson. You know that's purposeful. Of course, it, well, because we learn the most at that point. Yes. Um, and you could save us. In fact, I remember a time where I was actively falling on my face, and you said while I was falling on my face, I could save you, but that's not going to be the uh, the way that I'm going to do it because you're not going to learn as much at that point. And I kind of looked at you, and I was like, I'm going to kill you because how could you let me <laughs> fall on my face? But it's true. I learned so much from that experience. But you're very kind of hands-off, and you know where people's strengths are, and you pull it out of them, and you push them to really kind of be in that space and and out of their comfort zone to be better. I think it's important, you know, um, to master your strengths. You know, uh, there was a book, I think it's called Discover Your Strengths. And um, and if you master your strengths and not worry about your weaknesses, because too many people look at their weaknesses and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to try and work on my weaknesses. And Maybe they get to average. Maybe they even get a little bit above average. Right. But they're never going to get to mastery, yeah. right? So, but if your strengths, first of all, you like doing what you do, you know you're strong at, um, and so I think it's so important in a leader, especially also like like you alluded to, delegating the tasks that you are weak in um, that are you know required of a leader or required of an organization. Like I think that's uh, really important. So. I, so from my personal experience, what I've found is the as we as you grow in your trajectory and your responsibility, you know, as a loan officer, I remember that before I started getting coached, I was extremely controlling and I was controlling because I cared so much. And I was it was so important that our referral partner experience, that our client experience was a certain way. And so I did everything. And then you start realizing that's not scalable. So from a scale perspective, you have to learn to let go. You have to learn to have partners who are going to do different things. You have to have processors. You know, everybody in the organization has a role. And the, the, you know, I started realizing that the key in my mind to getting the most out of someone is not asking them to be you, but to see, see what's the most that I can get out of Sarah. Sarah is not me. She has a different pedigree than I do. Right. She's she's very competitive and she's fantastic at what she does. But if I try to get her to do it my way, if I try to get her to be me, I'm the one who's going to fall flat in my face, not the other way around. So I I learned through delegation uh, and through that process. Now, that being said, I'm going to flip it and I want your advice on this, because for me, dealing with someone who's an employee has been so much easier to lead in that regard. Leading salespeople, there I still struggle. My maturity level as a leader has not gotten to a certain place. So I, I, I welcome any feedback because where I struggle as a salesperson is that you have this ability all the time in the world to go out there and absolutely crush it. And what I'm left with is that 
not everyone desires and not everyone has that <laughs> that burn like I do to be successful and to to want amazing things for our clients. We have ability to change lives. So what is it that you do in your role as a leader of your brokerage uh, in order to to try to get the most out of a salesperson, not an ops? You know, ops, like I said, it, it, it's they're willing to work because they're they're affectionately of an employee. But you've got a self-employed person. How do you get the most out of them? I think every, you know, to your point, right, everyone defines success differently. We define, you know, if you define success in volume or, you know, how much money you have in your bank account, how much nice cars, you know, we live in Boca Raton. Um, it seems to be, uh, you know, the, the definition of success for a lot of people in Boca. Um, but that's not everyone. And so I think it's really important to ask questions, to understand uh, each individual salesperson, what their definition of success is, because their success may be going on one vacation a year with their family. Like, as long as I get that, that's my goal, then I've been successful for that year. So, you know, we may have loftier goals. Uh, they may have different goals. Right. And so I think it's important to ask questions. Do you test them? I don't test them. Um, what I do is I, I sit down and ask them questions, not about their business. Um, listen, we all have some business strategies that we uh, employ that we will use, you know, going forward, right? And the founding principles of, of, of what real estate is. However, I want to know the person because I want to know what makes them tick. I want to make, I want to know what makes them talk. You know, I want to make, you know, I want to know what no makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to know, like, I, I, yeah, I mean, I want to know why, um, why someone does something the way that they want to do it. Right. And I think it comes with, like you said, a maturity, um, you know, I used to not be like that. I used to be very controlling and no one's going to do it like me. So why would I let anyone else do it? Right. And, um, and then you realize, like, like you said, scalability, but it's not even scalability. I mean, to a point you're, you're just helping a lot more people. Yeah. Right. And a lot better service. Yeah. And so, um, if I can do that and do the strong things, that I'm really strong at, if I only take these two or three skills and the other skills are delegated, my, who wins? My consumer wins. Yeah. Because my consumer is that much uh, more taken care of. I, th I think you said something really important because we spend a lot of time finding out what somebody's strengths are, right? So we put them, the right person in the right seat, and that's always the goal. So if somebody's really good at, you know, planning events, that's where they're going to be, and that's where you're going to get the most out of them. If you had a conversation with all of your self-employed people, so in our case, loan officers, in your case, uh, agents, and you found out what their true definition of success is, what their goal is, if their goal is to just pay their bills and take their family on one vacation, no matter how much you push them, incentivize them, beat them up, you know, make them do certain amount of calls and everything else, you'll, you'll never get that out of them because it's not what they want to do and it's not where their measures are. And you have, you know, and then at that point, you can kind of relieve the stress a little bit and say, okay, this person, this is really what they're set out to do. This is their measure on success. This is what I'm going to get out of them because this is this is what their goal is ultimately. And then you've got another person that says, you know, there's sky's the limit. I want to make as many millions as possible. You know, you can push that, that person a little bit differently. So it's important to figure out what somebody's strong in. Yes, yeah, so you can use them the best, but also their idea of what that dream is, is different for everybody. And that yep. makes perfect sense. And I think you will stop frustrating yourself and beating your head against the wall and going, why aren't they doing what I say? Because I can make them so much more successful. Maybe that's not that imp that's not the important part to them. It's a different conversation. You know, when you have someone who is excited about having one vacation a year, just because that's not what you're excited about, yeah. um, you know, that's their goal. So instead of asking them about their business and, you know, um, did you sell anything, you know, you know, today? Did you sell anything today? Did you sell anything? When you continually ask them, that's actually going to hurt them. Yeah. Or that's like a, you were a $20 million agent last year. Let's go 50 this year. And they're yeah. like, I don't need that, though. Right. And you'll you'll get frustrated trying to push them into something that doesn't jive with them. It doesn't. It's not yeah. what they're what they want. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I mean, conversations are important and, and, and changing the conversation based on, you know, who you're talking to is obviously really important. So, um, you know, we, we try and do that. Uh, you know, we have to find out, you know, 
you know, I mean, we, it's so cliche, but we have to find out their why, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I mean, <laughs> I know it's like it sounds like an easy task, but it really is not. Like, you know, when you say like your why, right? Oh, okay, my kids, my family. But da, I think da, that's da, the obvious why. I don't think that's the a, honest no, why. No, no, it isn't. Yeah. You know, like why do you, like we want to fund the things that are fun, like yeah. that we like to do. Yeah. Like money has no intrinsic value. It's, it's a piece of paper, right? So, you know, I want to you know, have this many papers so that I could give it to someone else so that I could go on vacation or that I could go, you know, buy a nice car or I could go buy a nice house or whatever. Have the best bug collection. (laughs) Speaking of money, let's transition that. Let's use that as an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the things that are happening in real estate, the NAR settlement, and how that could affect commissions. Now, you know, certainly, again, I want to hear your opinion about it. both, you know, I guess as a broker owner and then also, you know, from uh, any perspective you want, really. And and because our show is called Stop Whining About Real Estate, I'd like you to also take a positive spin, if you could, and share with us how you will make your agents at your brokerage better. Oh, I'm totally whining. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wine away first, and then let, let's hear the wine, so, and then um, let's let's, let's you know, spin I, it. I, listen, I've been fortunate, I, I, you know, um, to be the president of Broward Palm Beach and St. Lucie Realtors. We represent nearly forty-two thousand realtors. Uh, we're the third largest in the country, and um, it's an honor and privilege. Uh, you know, um, you know, people start to wonder. Like, why would you want to be the president during this challenging and you know time? And you know, it's funny because I think leadership just chooses you, chooses the right leader at the right time. Yeah. And I never really understood that until the last month. <laughs> you're, you're a wartime president. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, we've we've done webinars with for our members, and and, and uh, we we continue to do. It. We have another one on April fifth at one p.m. So um, and it's with NAR uh, legal counsel Charlie Lee. So let's talk a little briefly about NAR settlement. Obviously, um, it's in the news. Uh, what happened was um, one of the news stories picked up the uh, before you know it was either leaked or whatever um, before the settlement was actually announced, and because of that, the media kind of spun. By the way, do you think that's intentional? Oh, no, no. It was 100 percent intentional. Okay. No, 100 um, percent. It was agreed upon that they wouldn't do it, but 100 percent it was. Um, it was it was an attack on the real estate industry. Absolutely. Um, and when you look at what's going on um, with our legislature, um, even our president, you mm-hmm. know, to this you day. see his comments he made the other day? I did. Um, what a and fast way to lose 1.8 million votes. It's crazy, but when you <laughs> look at no, no, but, and I'm not, and, and quite this honestly, isn't a political just so you know, show, but we're you don't have to be political. Page. What like, he said I donate, was, we're in real estate, I donate so. 50-50, right. Democrat, Republican. So um, this is not a political thing. It's just a, it's just an. Go ahead, uh, idiotic comment. One hundred percent. Because, because <laughs> listen, and, and I've asked consumers this, so I, you know, um, and I'm jumping around, but and I'll get to the NAR settlement, but the. I've been speaking to my database, my consumers, and saying, hey, have you heard about the NAR settlement? What have you heard? Because I want to know what they heard so that I could dispel the mess. So much misinformation. Yeah. So mainly, um, there's no such thing as a standard commission. There never has. There never will be. Um, There was no such thing as a 6% fixed NAR rule. That never happened ever so um, a lot of that um, is is mistruth. So let's get back to the actual truths and the facts. Uh, the settlement was four hundred eighteen million. Um, it's going to be paid over four years. Uh, the first, um, I think, two hundred million is going to be paid over one hundred and twenty days. Wow. Um, uh, most of it's going to be through uh, reserves and and budgeted items, and um, and then seventy million thereafter for the next three years. Uh, we're going to have a. Um, the offer of compensation, what people don't understand is the Department of Justice really didn't want the offer of compensation to be offered, period. So they, okay. However, NER did fight for it, and um, we fought for the offer of compensation, just not displayed through the MOS. And what does that look like? Right now, it's changing every day, kind of, um, interpretations, because it's a 108-page settlement 
uh, agreement. Um, if you do want to get more information, if you are a realtor, or even if you're just a consumer just trying to um, find out more information on a settlement agreement, facts.realtor is a great resource. Okay. Um, it has NER videos on it, has uh, frequently uh, asked questions on it, really, really good stuff. Um, so what does this look like? This looks like we're going to offer concessions, right? Um, a lot of people have been doing that for a while now. You know, um, there have been, you know, for the last five, six years, I mean, I know coaches that have trained a lot of the agents to take certain listings at a certain percentage and offer a very low percentage to the cooperating broker. And they're offering it through buyer's closing costs and, and or concessions. Mm -hmm. uh, so as of mid-July, there will not be a compensation field. There will not be a compensation field for residential real estate. Remember, this does not include rentals, and this does not include include commercial real estate. For anyone who's never seen an MLS, I mean, mm -hmm. basically for those that don't know, when you go on an MLS, especially from the agent view, it tells you exactly what was on the listing agreement, what the listing agent compensation was going to be, and what they're offering to the, the, the selling agent, also known as the buyer's agent. And that's what's going. That's one of the things that's going away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the pro I mean, well, the process was this, right? Um, listing broker goes to seller, negotiates the listing commission, discloses to the seller how much they're going to be offering the cooperating broker. Everyone signs off on it. Okay. And then they display it in the MOS. The only difference now is that they're going to not be able to display it on the MOS. They're going to have to display it off the MOS, whether that is through the concession tab in the MOS, whether that is through potentially a showing service, which we're still trying to get clarification on, um, or whether it's an automated voicemail, text, you know, wow. whatever it might be. Um, the commercial real estate market has been doing this for, you know, 30 years. Do you think this actually benefits the larger brokerages like yourself? Are you going to be allowed to have an intranet that, I don't want to say advertises, mm -hmm. but for lack of a better word, advertises what that compensation is? So you are not allowed to take the MOS data and display compensation. Okay. So if you take an IDX feed, like an internet data exchange feed, which most brokers do, then you will not be allowed to display um, compensation. So the idea of the Remaxes, the Kellers, the, the big boys, mm -hmm. their ability to have intra agents knowing information won't happen. You're going to have to make a phone call in order Potentially. to find Potentially. Now, are there workarounds? Absolutely, right? If you don't take the IDX feed and you do it through a third-party syndication service or there's, um, you know, other different sites or portals that are hubs maybe that are going to, um, you know, transmit the data to somewhere else, um, you know, there's going to be different opportunities for that. But, you know, I think we're getting in the weeds, right? To really explain it is nothing has really changed, just the way that we're communicating the offer of compensation has changed. Um, buyer's agents are still going to get paid. Despite what anyone says, commissions reduced, increased, whatever. I mean, I know that there are a lot of agents out there that have said, you know what, I'm going to increase my commission percentage because I'm going to be doing a lot more for my consumers. I'm going to put, you know, my money where my mouth is, and I'm going to go ahead and put a great marketing plan so that I get more exposure for my clients. So there are going to be different business models. There always has. So really, that hasn't changed. The one thing that I think people will have to get used to is the buyer brokerage agreements. Um, not everyone has been used to those buyer brokerage agreements. So, um, you know, in mid-July, basically, you will be forced to sign a, or a buyer will be required, a buyer's agent will be required to get a buyer brokerage agreement from a prospective buyer prior to showing. Now, do you, so my personal belief is this is, that alone is the reason that, and I don't know what the number is. I don't really have a prediction. It'd, it'd be foolish for me to give a number, but I do think for people who have been used to, uh, not professionals, but the part-timers, someone who's held a license and says, uh, you know, hey, David, we're cousins. Don't worry. I'll, t I'll do your loan. The seller will pay my fee. I do think a lot of those agents will leave. 
One hundred percent. I yeah. think it's going to. I think what they'll be is they'll end up being referral agents. They'll keep their license, hand over the referral, let a professional, you know, sit there, present their value prop to that buyer, do the negotiation, whatever it is. Is that good for a consumer? I think so. One hundred percent. You know, listen. I, <clears throat> I know. It, I know it's really scary for those agents out there, and I understand that this is new and it's something that change. Like in any company, nobody likes change. Um, I can tell you that when we went through our rules and we went from the wild, wild west, uh, and then all of a sudden you had to be licensed in Florida. I started this in 2005. We went from 110,000 loan officers in this state alone. Keep in mind, nationally, we're, we're under 80,000 right now, nationally. We were at 110,000, and we had 90% attrition. We went down to 11,000 once you had to get licensed. And it, for those of us who survived, it was fantastic. So now let's take the that. So for me, it was an opportunity to grow my business. Let's take the wine away. Tell us the opportunity for you and your brokerage, how you're going to grow coming out of this. You got to be able to articulate your value proposition. Yep. You know, um, you know, we've been you know, luckily our association has been looking at this for the last three years. We've been playing scenario planning. We've been able to help a lot of our agents um, and a lot of our members. And one of the things that they can do better than really, if you are, if you have a buyer's system, a system, and, and you know, just like a listing presentation, buyer presentation, your marketing, um, you know, um, you have an off market database. You have, you know, ways to get to different sellers um, within particular farm areas or neighborhoods. You know, there's a lot of things that you could be doing to add value to that consumer. And if you do that and you do that well, you're going to crush it. Absolutely crush it. Um, Listing brokers, going to kill it, right? Um, You know, old saying, you know, you list your last, you know, kind of thing. It's true. You know, um, we also say LIFO, last in, first out. It's true. You know, fringe realtors, yeah, they're going to be gone. Um, it's going to be very difficult for them to substantiate uh, whether or not um, why they would be, continue to be. Now, I will say this. There's a lot of chatter, a lot of chatter on, you know, NER, whether they, you should be, you know, I, I you know, NER sold us down the road and all this stuff. And that's just uneducated opinions because I could tell you right now, Ethan Glass, who was the plaintiff's attorney, did a phenomenal job. I don't know if you heard his opening statement, mm-hmm. but his story was really cool. His opening statement, it was interesting because he put it in layman's terms. His opening statement was this. The MOS is compared to what we're talking about is compared to a lost dog in your neighborhood, right? Okay. You lose the dog. You could knock on the, each door, where's my dog, where's my dog, where's my dog? Or you could go to the local grocery store. You can go to the, uh, you know, the FPL polls. You could put these bulletin boards together, these big posters all around. And we, we get a bunch of people and we put them all around. And we put on their reward. $5,000. Well, if you don't bring me the lost dog, you don't get the reward. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you've exposed it to a lot more people right. than knocking on the door. Yeah. Right? So same thing as the MOS. I thought he did an excellent job. Unfortunately, um, you know, they didn't win and whatever, but I think they did an excellent job. We need one voice. This is uh, the detractors want us to break away from NAR because without, if we break away, they're going to crush the real estate industry, right? Yeah. But if we're together as an NAR, now maybe we decide down the line that NAR is not going to work for us. But right now, we need them more than anything. Yeah. I've actually heard that there's a theory that NAR membership <laughs> will actually increase because the way that I heard of the settlement, if you are not an NAR member, you are not protected under these lawsuits. So however many of these agents that are out there that are not part of these MLSs and part of the NAR as membership, they're, they're subject to continuous lawsuits. Yeah. Um, now, class choice status, I think, is, I think that is next week probably. And that's when, as long as you are an NAR member, by then, 
Um, so covered. if there was going to be an up uptick, uptick in membership, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be in the next week. couple weeks. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So are there any options we can we can trade on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing yeah. agents and loan what's, officers, what's the last minute. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I mean, you know, listen, I I think that um, the NAR settlement was something that they had to do. Um, you know, are they are they right? 100% NER is in the right, but it doesn't matter whether you're in the right. Um, it's, you know, when you talk about a member-centric organization, they made this decision. They wanted to fight. They made this decision based on the members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the heart, they, they couldn't put the members through another two, three more years of this stuff, right? Maybe even longer. And, you know, and perhaps, you know, they'd have to put up a bond— that bond would be significant, mm -hmm. um, and that bond probably would um, force uh, NER into uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which then would have had an issue with, you know, a lot of the things going forward. Are they able to actually pay the, the yes. $400 million? Okay. Yeah. It's not going to cripple? Nope. Nope. And, uh, you know, they have had they have committed to—I um, was with— um, uh, Kevin Sears, the president of NER, um, this past week. Uh, it's good timing because uh, <laughs> President Circle, which is a, uh, a event with um, legislators and, and um, some of the high influential people, um, were in Miami. It was in Fountain Blue. Mm -hmm. and, um, that and place is boring, huh? Yeah, I heard about terrible. that trip. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do down there. Uh, I wish Liv wasn't there. But, um, yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was um, it was enlightening. Right. You get, you get a better understanding yeah. of things. Um, and um, listen, you know, we could say why me or whatever, but that's not this is not the time to do that. This is time to stick together and look for the opportunities like you uh, alluded to. I love it. Wrapping up. Yeah. David, tell us. And we, thank you so much for, for being here and your time. What is the one thing uh, and, and not for, from an agent perspective, what's the one piece of advice as, as you know, this is our inaugurate uh, show. And so we're, we're really excited to have you. What's the one piece of advice you have for us that when we look back at our hundredth show, you're going to be like, see, I told you. <laughs> I, you got to have fun, right? Like, I mean, it's got to be lively. It's got to be fun. Um, you know, you're going to have some boring guests and maybe I'm that. But uh, you'll, you'll, look, you'll look at it back then or whatever, right? So I, I just think that you have to be lively and you have to love the topics that you're talking about, which you clearly do, right? Yeah. And, um, you know. More the wine than the real estate. But, yes, we, we nah, get the concept. Listen, <laughs> nah, listen, I mean, uh, I mean, maybe that's the thing, right? The stick, right? Like, yeah. all right, you know, now that we went through this, what do you really want to whine about, right? At the end, right? Like, yeah, you want to whine about, yeah. all right, we'll give you 30 seconds to whine. All right, yeah, go, go for it. Yes. Go for it. All right, well, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to whine about? Start us I, off. I want, I want to whine about um, uneducated um, people um, just jumping on the bandwagon for media. And um, I, and I'm really annoyed. This is me, David Searle, not on behalf of the Broward Palm Beach and St. Lucie Realtors. <laughs> I'm very disappointed in um, our president um, and his comments. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't heard his comments, he basically said that um, the affordable housing crisis was um, based because the realtors aren't lowering their commissions, and he implores them to lower their commissions. And for the first time in history, they're going to um, be able to, buyers and sellers are going to be able to negotiate commissions, which we know is clearly wrong. So that's my whining for today. Um, not to get political, but that's, it's just, it's, it's really unfortunate. And I hope that they understand that um, realtors, you know, really are a resource and they employ a lot more people than just realtors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, guys. Thank you this for cool. a successful Do you want to dance or something? We session. did it. We did our yeah, first one. Yeah. Yeah. So, very good. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you very much. Tune in next week. We'll have another great guest. And uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.